Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. And right now it's time to take the global stories that are making headlines, well, in our national dailies. And joining me to review these papers is Professor Camilo Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science at Bayero University, Kanu. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning and thank you very much. Thank you. Good to have you here. All right, um, so we're going to start with the punch this morning, but I mean, there's one headline that is on almost all of the papers that we have. So on the punch, it says, Eagles clinch silver as Cote d'Ivoire win AFCON. And um, the writer on this one says, Eagles saved worst performance for the final match. Now on the Guardian, it also says, Elephants shock Super Eagles to win 2023 AFCON. And then on the Daily Trust, we have Cote d'Ivoire overpower Nigeria to lift Afghan 2023 trophy. Like I was saying just before um, we came on air, I was just saying I, I, wish, I wish our first conversation was, congratulations, we are the winners of the Afghan. I mean, that was what I was hoping for. But sadly, um, our boys did not do justice to it to bring the trophy home. But I want to know what your thoughts are on this one. Uh, actually, um, everybody was very hopeful that um, the Eagles would make it, yeah. especially given their performance uh, in the match so far. And uh, it, maybe what they did to Cote d'Ivoire in the first uh, round. Mm. Uh, so people are very hopeful. But it's a game. Uh, you know, somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. That is my own take. And secondly, uh, to me, they put in their best. Look at, um, literally, they are playing not only the team, but mm. also the spectators. You know, the huge crowd there that was so intimidating, even though they are professional. But I think given what they did, actually, we, we shouldn't uh, just get them. Okay, they put in their best uh, uh, in defense of uh, the national honors. And uh, even though their base is not good enough to give us the goal, but uh, we should be happy that um, out of the many, they are able to come uh, second, uh, mm -hmm. despite the intimidating crowd. Yeah. I mean, I watched the game yesterday. I watched the whole 90 minutes, and I saw how full the stadium was. In fact, I was telling my friend, the stadium is orange because that was the color that was being flown across. Like you could barely see Nigerians there. So I understand, you know, what the intimidating crowd can be like. However, um, the second goal, I just felt it was not necessary. Like I was, I was stunned. I was like, what's going on? Why are you guys not doing anything? And the game seemed a little bit feisty, which you would expect with um, every finals because, you know, there's, there's stuff on the line. But I mean, with, with all of this, what I'm just going to say is we're so proud of the Super Eagles. Um, we've come thus far and it's, it's a privilege, it's an honor to actually get the silver. So it wasn't the gold that we're expecting, but you know how they say aim for the sky and you might just fall on the stars. So I guess that's just what this is. And we just hope that, I mean, come next AFCON or the World Cup or whatever tournament that we go for. I think the, 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 back, the women basketball, they should be playing, they should be playing really soon as well. So we're just hoping that for every tournament, we just keep getting better and better on our team. Um, keep making us proud. But as of today, we're so proud of the Super Eagles and what they've been able to achieve at the AFCON 2023. All right, so let's move over to another, um, another story. And this one is quite devastating, if I can use that word. So over the weekend, we were saddled with some, um, you know, very, very sad news. The fact that um, Herbert Wigwe passed away in a helicopter crash with his wife and his first son. And so the punch here has it as heartbroken. Nigerians mourn Wee's kid, Wigwe. Um, the writers here are friends, well wishes, recall late CEO's life and times. Nigeria may demand reports as U.S. probes crash. He was unlike other Nigerian big men, says Menti. Wigwe exits of a banking whiskey. And Tinubu Abiodun family friends mourn stock exchange giant Ogumbanjo. Um, so where were you when you heard this news and how, what was your initial reaction? I'm sure for most people, they probably thought 
please, this should not be real. This should not be true. But um, what are your thoughts and how, how did you receive the news? Actually, it is had a, a broken uh, that um, uh, he died. Um, you know, the, the issue now is it is coming out that it is uh, due to bad weather. Uh, so uh, maybe um, one, if, you know, when, when I had the news initially, I thought maybe it was here in Nigeria, mm -hmm. you know, in the social media, then we begin to think of sabotage and other things. Uh, but uh, when we heard that uh, this is why it happened, and then later they said uh, it's weather, we know that then there is nothing one can do, but um, at least hope uh, that uh, the family will have the fortitude to bear the loss, even the whole nation, because uh, somebody is after his demise that uh, his good aspect will be uh, made known to the people. Uh, so we hope uh, these things, um, uh, as they say, the, the government will look into it and also we get the report. Uh, yeah. Even though preliminary report shows it is weather, then perhaps uh, something will be done in order to avoid uh, similar incidences in the future. Well, this is just the colossal loss to to Nigeria. This is a colossal loss to the banking um, and finance industry, and it's it's quite heart wrenching to get such a news. Um, but yes, like, like you said, we just pray that the families, the people who are near and dear to the Uyghur family just have the fortitude to bear this loss um, right now. It is an irreparable loss, an irreparable loss. But yes, we just, we just pray that, you know, they find strength even in this time. All right, we move over to another headline here, and this is coming from the IMF. It says, Nigeria facing worsening economic crisis. Please, I really want to know your take on this one. I want to know whether the grass is greener on your side or maybe you're part of the Nigerians that might just be facing the worsening economic crisis. Really, uh, I, I, in my side and like in any other uh, part of the country, the grass is becoming drier and drier, <laughs> not uh, greener and greener at all. Uh, of course, you see... Uh, the, the policies that we are taking on the issue seem to be like we are grappling. We just try this one and we try the other one. And uh, it seems like um, actually there is no concrete plan uh, to take us out of uh, the system, I mean, out of the crisis that we are in. And uh, I think in previous shows, we say it that uh, we cannot be doing the same thing and expect a different result. This issue, you know, for over three decades now, I think since 85 when we tried uh, the sub, uh, and uh, to date we are having these uh, problems. So I think the government needs to look into it, uh, especially now that uh, even IMF and uh, World Bank are telling us that there is problem. So we need to tighten our bill and face these issues. Mm. Okay, so talking about that, um, Nigeria facing the worsening economic crisis, there's a small headline at the bottom that says Nigeria to become food exporter through mechanized farming, and that is being said by Tinubu. Um, do you believe this is possible? I know that we have agriculture, but no. you're, you're, you're seeing cases whereby um, there is insecurity. Most people cannot even go to their farms to farm because bandits come in there, seize their lands, kidnap, and even kill some of them. So they're not able to farm the way they, they would want to. Um, even having to move the produce, so the little that they're able to farm, having to move it to the big cities, there's no proper road network. And even when you're moving them, there's insecurity on the road as well, right? So then let's talk about the cost of um, transportation as well, because fuel is at a all time high, if I, can, if I can say that. So when you have all of these things, all of these different factors that keep um, posing as challenges, do you think it's possible for us to become the, a food exporter through mechanized farming that Tinubu says, you know, that we could, we could, we could be? Given the circumstances now, I think it is not possible. 
Uh, even though uh, God has endowed us with uh, abundant natural resources and uh, good weather, you know, uh, that we can be able to do that, but at least uh, for now, given the high level of insecurity in the country, which, uh, you know, prevents so many of the farmers to go to their farm, and secondly, given the high expense of, uh, you know, uh, mechanized, uh, uh, you know, material, uh, mm -hmm. fertilizer, instrument, and other things. And thirdly, given the high cost of uh, transportation, I think this is, we are just banking on hope. We hope it will work. But unless we take uh, concrete measures to address all these challenges, I think we will uh, not be able to meet that uh, target or being net exporter uh, of uh, product. In fact, I think in one of the papers today, you know, one of them said even the government, uh, who is saying that they are going to be, where well, they are hoping that will be net exporter, is saying that they are going to import uh, food in order to supplement uh, what you, what to, uh, the problem we are having, that they are going to open the grain silos and uh, if that one hasn't sol uh, solved the problem in the next three months or so, we are going to import. So I see there is contradiction here. In one place, we are saying we are going to import. In another thing, we are making, uh, we are hoping that we are going to be next uh, net exporters mm. while we haven't taken any concrete step in terms of making that uh, hope a reality. And if you even look at it, um, businesses are not thriving so well at the moment. You're seeing businesses move away. Um, a lot of um, manufacturers are actually moving out of Nigeria. So is the environment even conducive enough for us to... Because farming is one thing, but if you're going to be exporting, you're doing business. So you're doing business with other countries. Um, do we even have enough manpower, enough human capital to be able to run a business that we can start to export to other people. And my next question is, so what are these challenges? Like, how, how do you highlight these challenges and um, the solutions to them? So the challenges that we've talked about that might become a, 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 a big issue for us to be the exporter of food, as we say, because now we're saying we want to import on one hand and in another breath, we're saying, or rather, we're saying we want to export, we want to become a food exporter on one hand, and in another breath, we're saying we want to import as well. So all of these challenges that we have, how do we mitigate them, and what are the solutions we can do to, you know, achieve that whole food exporter that we say we want to be? You see, the, the past major thing is to develop the political will to address them, okay? Uh, the will that um, these are challenges, but they are not unsurmountable. Uh, for example, the issue of insecurity. Uh, if we have the will and uh, we are committed to uh, those things, I mean, addressing it will be able to do something. And secondly, in terms of the expenses, yeah, in terms of uh, how do we now have uh, fertilizer and others in the course of transportation, yeah, to the government has to take the bull by the horn and face the challenge. We shouldn't uh, just sit down and back on, bank on hope. Hoping is one thing, but you have to take uh, concrete measures. You see, as far as public policy is concerned, once you plan, if you don't take concrete measures to implement the planning, then you are bound to, to fail. Uh, that is what we are having in Nigeria. We, we keep on saying that, yes, we are going to do this, we are going to do that. And uh, there is no concrete plan on the ground. Even if we have it, we don't attempt to implement it. Secondly, there is the issue of corruption. All things surrounding these uh, challenges that we have, uh, the threat that runs through them all is corruption. So unless we also address the issue of corruption, uh, these things will also remain a, a, a mayor for, for us. So I think this is where the government needs to come and uh, come in and needs to listen to the people. Now that uh, for long, you know, the government uh, seemed to uh, take less interest in, I mean, in hearing the people cry. Now that uh, IMF and other uh, foreigners, um, I mean, 
Now, World Bank uh, can say that there is problem, there is problem. Perhaps I'm hopeful that uh, this time around with uh, such powerful uh, uh, words from uh, these powerful bodies, maybe the government will now need a needful and try to address the issues. Okay, um, so I just want to take one more headline here on the punch, and this says Disco's overcharge 7.1 million customers in nine months. And this is being said by the federal government. So our Disco's are overcharging 7.1 million customers. What do you think about this one? I think this is a rip off. Uh, you know, since. Um uh, for long, we have been talking of, uh, you know, instead of uh, estimates, we should have meters, uh, you know. But uh, the corruption around uh, the system is what is uh, causing all this problem. One, the meters are not uh, that available. Uh, people are given estimate, and the estimate is somebody would just sit down and, you know, uh, cut in and say, this is what is... Uh, uh, what you should pay. So I think it is quite unfortunate that uh, over 7 million people are overcharged unnecessarily. And uh, it's a double jeopardy. There is uh, overcharging and there is no supply of light. And this goes a long way towards the problem that we are talking, no conducive environment for the business to have. Operate no conducive environment for, uh, for even the people uh, to operate. So I mean to survive. So I think this is a, a double jeopardy, like I said, where people are overcharged and the light is not available, and uh, you know there is corruption around the thing. So I think this is uh, quite unfortunate. I'm curious to know the fact that these people have been overcharged. Are they going to be refunded? Um, are there going to be consequences for you know whoever is at the top that made this happen? Because Nigeria is already hard enough. The economy is crazy, and people cannot even afford a lot of things. And then the little money that you have, you overcharge a whole 7.1 million people for electricity. So what happens now? Do they get a refund? Um, does anyone get sacked? And is that even a compensation? Because, I mean, in other parts of the world, you would see um, cases like this, even when you miss your flight, or, or rather maybe when the airline cancels a flight, they compensate you with something else. So are people going to be compensated? You know, like, oh, we're sorry that we overcharge you. Here is a refund, and maybe here is some token, again, um, just extra top up for your electricity. So what is going to be done with, with this overcharging 7.1 million Nigerians from their hard-earned money? Unfortunately, nothing is going to be done, given the, the Nigerian situation. Uh, you see, since 1979, I mean, 78, 79, when the, the Constitution was being framed, one of the issues that uh, I remember then uh, that was hotly debated was the issue of making uh, then NEPA justiciable that if they do anything, then people can have the right to go to court and suit, uh, sue them. Yeah. But, uh, you know, somehow the premise of the Constitution protected them. And so now, even if you go, you cannot uh, uh, protection. And secondly, you know, uh, we are used to uh, impunity in Nigeria, mm -hmm. even if uh, you know, people are found uh, culpable in this situation. I don't think anything will be done uh, to punish them. So, uh, to me, I am rather pessimistic that uh, Nigerians will get uh, compensation uh, from this, what happened, this overcharge, because of what I've said earlier. All right. <clears throat> Let's move over to The Guardian. And the major headline here talks about Exiting oil firms pollute Niger Delta with 36.1 million liters of crude oil in eight years. So we're talking about pollution right now. And the exiting oil firms, you know, have polluted the Niger Delta with 36.1 million liters of crude oil in eight years. Um, so what do you think about this? And is there anything that is um, any agency, 
any government, yes, agency that's trying to stop this pollution because we're talking about our waters right now. We're talking about um, the ecosystem. And pollution is not one thing that helps us. Instead, it, 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 it deteriorates the ecosystem. So if we're seeing 36, because that's, a quite, that's quite a high number, 36.1 million liters of crude oil being polluted in the Niger Delta area. So what do you think about this? And are they, are they not supposed to be doing something about this to ensure that this is not happening and we're not polluting our waters? You see, in other climes, this is a very serious thing that, uh, uh, you know, the affected people will go to court. Even the government will go, will sue the companies and get uh, compensation. One, there is uh, no major effort to even clean the system. Secondly, there are so many litigations around uh, these issues and uh, nothing is being done. At the end of it, you know, the life of the people has been affected, the environment has been affected. In fact, uh, their source of livelihood, uh, most of them depend on fishing, and uh, also even drinking water, good drinking water has been affected in the area. And the unfortunate thing is that uh, it is now moving up even to upstream into the ocean. Uh, this uh, has gone there. So I think uh, it is a very serious uh, problem. Uh, over the eight years, you know, 36 or something million liters is, is a huge thing yeah. over the years. So I think uh, what we need to do is actually to give teeth to the laws uh, to ensure that people are adequately compensated. Uh, the government should not just allow the affected people to be challenging the companies because they cannot uh, uh, master the energy and the resources and the power to actually challenge uh, those companies, given the huge companies that are uh, involved, multinational companies. So I think here the government needs to come in uh, in order not only to clean the damage, uh, the pollution, but uh, not only to force them to clean it, but to force them also to pay compensation uh, to uh, you know, the government and to the people, so that at least this thing will be seriously taken into account. Otherwise, if we allow it, it will continue. Uh, this is just SDS. You know, it has been a lingering issue, this pollution for long. And uh, actually, the paper has done a good job by looking at it, documenting it year by year, the amount of uh, pollution that has taken place and it seems to be on on the increase uh since within these eight years let's let's, let's just look at this <laughs> this other one um we're looking at serap and this is one of our top trending stories so we're looking at serap suing Akpabu abbas over 344.85 billion naira national assembly budget. Now, if you recall, um, this is a jump in what the appropriation bill was initially, and they came up with 344.85 billion naira. And Serap is suing, probably obviously suing the, 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 the national assembly over this budget. What do you think about this? Do you think this is a whole lot of money? Or do you think it's, it's value for money? Like, oh, yes, they definitely need this to be able to go about their duties. Or do you think they're just, you know, being frivolous spenders? Yeah, I think they are being frivolous uh, spenders. And uh, we need, we need uh, such NGOs and even the public uh, to be on their toes uh, so that uh, we can check uh, these things. Otherwise, if we just keep quiet, uh, with okay. challenging these such issues, I think we are going to see more and worse cases than what we are seeing now. Even if it is a cobble, this is a, a public uh, money. It is not for the assembly, it is not for the government, it is not for anybody, I mean, uh, for uh, the judiciary, but rather it's for Nigeria. So somebody, that, that is what democracy is about. Somebody has to be there in order to make sure that things are done appropriately and uh, things are done uh, you know in a transparent way otherwise when we say okay yeah, these people keep on going you know we, uh, 
to the court, suing this and suing that, and we don't encourage them and we don't support them. So we are going to see the worst part, I mean, worst part of it uh, in the future. So to me, I think it is a good thing. Uh, we have to uh, be doing that, and the NGOs are doing it on our behalf, so we shall give them all the necessary support, and in part tonight, should be should have their eyes on how public resources are spent, are utilized, uh, otherwise, and the democratic system will have no meaning to Nigerians. It will have meaning only to very few people who will corner the resources and use it for their own personal benefit. Yeah. I think the Nigerian people deserve some level of transparency. Um, if you're going to, I, I don't have a problem with you um, coming out with a budget and saying this is how much you need. As long as you can come and defend the budget and, you know, we can see that you're using it for, you're using it judicial, judiciously. You're not just spending frivolously and, you know, using it for your own personal purposes. So we deserve some level of transparency. If you come out and you say, okay, this is what we're using this money for, and everybody sees that it, it is fair and there's value in it, why not? But you cannot be using taxpayers' money for what we don't know. You're not coming out to report anything. We're not seeing we're not seeing anything. You're not telling us anything. You're not giving us any reports, nothing whatsoever. You just demand for this money and you expect it to be given to you. But this is taxpayers' money. These are people who have worked so hard. And we have a lot of things that we need compared to your houses and your cars and you know what? Let me not just let me not just go into another sermon right now. Let's look at this other um, headline. It says Tinubu berates Asu and others for criticizing student loan scheme. Says no going back. I'm sure you've seen the the um, student loan scheme that was brought out by the president. I think that was last year. There were a lot of criteria, right? And a lot of people have been saying uh, people cannot even afford this this scheme. The 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 criteria is so rigid that you might not be able to get it. You cannot get the loan. Um, but anyways, Tinubu has come out to berate Asu because Asu was one of those people who, who said, nah, this doesn't work. And now he's saying, you know, there's no going back. He has berated them for criticizing the, 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 the scheme. So what do you think about this one? You see, actually, uh, I am a member of Asu and uh, I've been very critical of the... A scheme. Um, but I think uh, I listen to what uh, Nigerians said about it. I forget whether it is ASU or Labour or whatever. Uh, is this going to work? Are Nigerians happy with it? Uh, is it accessible to uh, by Nigerians? So I think these are the things which the government has to take. They, they shouldn't be so militaristic that uh, since they have uh, I planned it, there is no going back. I think that is government, uh, a democratic government should do. The, a democratic government should listen to stakeholders. And uh, if there is need uh, to adjust, uh, you know, whatever it is you to adjust, or even to abandon the program and Uh, take a, a new one. It, there is this as it's all about but, um, because uh, Asu is the one who is talking about it. We are the major stakeholders. We know what is going to happen. We have been in this system for many years, and we have seen the transformation of the system. So we are not just criticizing it because uh, for the sake of criticizing it, but we are criticizing it for its feasibility whether it will actually address what uh, it set out to do. So I think the government ought to listen to, not only us, but uh, like I said, to stakeholders. We have parents, we have teachers, we have uh, the students themselves. Let it be known, you know, so that people will know what it entails. And especially given the conditions that are set in there, uh, I think many Nigerians will not be able to benefit from that system. And even if uh, many, some people are able to assist it, I mean, to assess it, 
I think at the end of it, the fear is there will be too much corruption around it, which will set it like all other uh, things, um, other policies that we have, uh, the tendency for uh, corruption to make the system to fail. So uh, I think, uh, to me, the government ought to listen. Uh, we shouldn't be saying there is no going back. Uh, it is a democratic system, and we are, the government is in the name of the people. So you should listen to the people. Right. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if the government is listening to the people on this one. And this small headline here says hardship. Um, this is still on The Guardian. And I'll take another one from, from the business NG. And this says hardship. States in Nigeria risk total collapse amid rising hunger. Unemployment, Dakba says reports. And then on um, the business NG, it says economic hardships need for specific blueprints to address inflationary pressures. What do you think about this one? Do you think, um, yeah, I, 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 I want to believe it's the hardship that is making people move away, move abroad, because they are all searching for greener pastures. And right now, the same states, you know, in Nigeria is collapse amid the rising hunger. So what are some... Um, what are some blueprints, specific blueprints, like uh, they've said on, on the business NG, to address these inflationary pressures that we have in Nigeria? You see, we have said it several times in this program and even uh, in previous ones that uh, the unfortunate thing is there is no concrete plan to address uh, these issues. Mm -hmm. Since, uh, you know, at May 29th, when the government rolled out uh, mm -hmm. this subsidy, uh, the, the floating of the right and other things, you know, inflation has been, you know, uh, rising astronomically. And, uh, but we, we keep on saying that is, we, this is not how public policies are. Public, public policies all over the world are planned. Uh, you must have a blueprint of what you you are here today. Where are you going in the next uh, two years, three years, or ten years? You must have a, a plan. But if you look at what we are having now, there is no concrete plan on this issue. We have just talked about uh, like the government trying to say we are going to be net importers of food, but there is no plan how to uh, say make uh, you know. Uh, production of the food, uh, and uh, we are talking of, uh, you know, the corruption around the system. So I think uh, uh, this is what uh, the government ought to come up with a concrete plan on what we are going to do, both short-range and long-range plan on how to address it. Otherwise, actually, we we are just playing with fire. I I think it was uh, it is the United Nations or whatever which says that uh, uh, for every ten person in, uh, who are multidimensionally hungry in the world, one is a Nigerian. And they said about seventy percent of Nigeria are multidimensionally poor, and so on. So these are uh, serious policy challenges which are not only economical, they are social, they are political, they are security, everything in one, and this issue of uh, hunger, inflation, and so on. So I think we need a plan. Um, I know the government keep on talking of renewed hope agenda, renewed hope agenda, but the renewed hope agenda, what are the concrete things that are put in ground to renew the hope of Nigerians uh, that things will work out? Mm. Well, <laughs> we can only hope that they have a plan, they have those um, specific blueprints to renew the hope of Nigerians because I would say that our hopes are quite dashed at the moment. Um, poverty is rising. It's ridiculous, but it's rising. And, you know, a lot of people are sad. People are not happy with the way the economy is. So, well, we just hope that the, the hopes of Nigerians will be renewed and we'll get to start to see a blossoming, a flourishing nation in the nearest future. I mean, as soon as possible. And there's nothing 
there's nothing that cannot happen as long as you set your mind to it. So now we need our politicians to set their minds to making Nigeria a better nation. But I think this is where we're going to drop it here on this segment. Thank you so much for coming in and reviewing the papers with us. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Have a, have a good day. All right, we've been speaking to Professor Kamelu Sani Fage, and he is from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kanu, and we've just been reviewing the papers um, to see what the national dailies have been saying this morning. We'll go on a short break, look at the weather, and when we return, we'll be looking at our first hot topic. Please stay with us. <laughs>